Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this Fox Williams webinar on uh, changes which are being made to consumer law and enforcement in the UK and in the EU, uh, which are coming down the pipeline this year. Uh, now, many of you will have hopefully received and read our horizon scanning series that we published uh, towards the end of last year, where we were looking at what's going to happen in 2022 and some of the key areas of regula regulatory reform. And to my mind, this topic that we're talking about today is probably going to be the most important regulatory change facing the travel industry this year. Um, and I say this because for the first time, the regulators are um, going to give the the, the, themselves powers to impose eye-wateringly significant fines, putting compliance with consumer law on the same level as compliance with GDPR and competition law. Um, now, the regulators have been complaining for a long time about how their enforcement powers are quite ineffectual. And we've seen that over the course of the last you know, tw 12 to 24 months with various uh, enforcement activities happening in the refund space by the CMA. But we've also seen it years previous to that with the CMA and also the CAA taking enforcement action concerning um, advertising and marketing practices of travel companies, where inevitably the process has been very long-winded and is one that um, has ultimately resulted in travel companies giving undertakings um, to rectify certain behaviours, um, which, which um, just the process sucks up um, capacity within the regulators. And they've complained um, for a very long time that they need you know, better enforcement tools to be able to achieve compliance sooner. And that having especially the powers to impose significant fines would help ensure that um, the, 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 the travel companies comply with consumer law before enforcement action having to be taken. So that's what we're going to um, focus on today. And Jess, if, if we could have the next slide, please. Um, now, just starting with um, looking at what the landscape looks like at the moment. When we talk about consumer law in the travel sector, it's probably convenient to look at it in uh, in, in, in two ways. You've got your general consumer law, which looks like, at things such as unfair contract terms, uh, misleading advertising, um, other regulations dealing with mandatory pre-contract disclosures that have to be given to consumers. Now, these general consumer laws apply sort of across all sectors and across all industries. So they apply to travel as they do to other industries. Um, you've then got within the travel sector itself some specialist consumer laws and obviously these are things like the package travel regulations, at all regulations and EU regulation 261. Now one of the things that the uh, regulators are looking at in the UK and the EU is how the these general consumer laws need to be modernized to take into account um, modern sales techniques and current challenges that the regulators faced. I mean, many of these um, regulations are now very old um, and some of them even sort of pre pre predate the internet. So they need a bit of a refresh, they need to be modernized. And that's one of the purposes behind um, the, these regulatory reforms. Next slide, please. Um, now, similarly with enforcement, uh, in the UK, the regulators essentially have uh, two uh, different forms of enforcement powers. They have their civil enforcement powers, which involves uh, a regulator taking a travel company to the civil court. So that would either be a county court or the high court and ultimately seek an order from the court that the travel company does something or doesn't do something. Um, the, these are um, civil enforcement tools. They don't result in any criminal sanctions being imposed, imposed against the travel company. 
and inevitably, as, as we've seen with the um, cases that the CMA have taken over the last 18 months, they usually settle by way of the travel company giving a form of undertaking to the regulator, which is effectively just settling the civil case. Um, now, the, the, the CMA and the CAA in, in particular have complained for a long time that that process um, is, is too long-winded. There is a case which is quite well known involving the C, CAA and Ryanair, which has been going on for over two years where the CAA are seeking um, and actually obtained enforcement orders against Ryanair to force Ryanair to refund um, a certain category of customers. Now that case went on, as I said, for at least two years. It's actually being appealed and is, is in the Court of Appeal today. Um, uh, and the trouble uh, with that for the CAA is that it, it's made what should have been, from their point of view, quite a simple matter into something which is very long-winded, which is very expensive for them to run, and which just sucks up resources. So these civil enforcement powers are seen as being um, fairly, fairly inadequate and are too sort of heavily weighted in the favour of the travel company, which you know ca can um, take advantage of the system, um, uh, and you know knowing that don't have the same incentive to ensure that they're compliant with the relevant regulations in the first place. Now the criminal enforcement powers in the UK are very very rarely used. Um, I, I'm I'm not aware of any criminal enforcement cases having taken place you know, re relating to well-known companies in the UK since um, we, we had an atoll issue involving Travel Republic you know, many years ago. The, these criminal enforcement powers are generally reserved for um, uh, effectively fraud or fraudulent behavior where sham travel companies are set up in order to um, defraud customers um, and there have been prosecutions in relation to those sorts of companies but you know these these powers are generally not used to you know for, to, to achieve compliance um, across uh, across the board um, now as I said under under both of those regimes there are no powers for the regulators themselves to impose fines and I know in other jurisdictions outside of the UK, um, and actually even within the UK with GDPR, for instance, the regulators do have the power to impose fines for non-compliance, which they see as being a really sort of effective and persuasive enforcement tool that they have. Um, now for this sort of general um, consumer law, and also for the sector specific travel law that we have in the UK, uh, the regulators don't, don't have powers to impose fines. Um, we do have in the UK a limited form of uh, representative action that can be taken. So certain um, private bodies such as which are uh, given powers to seek redress under uh, uh, so, so some of the consumer legislation on behalf of uh, an, uh, a, a body of consumers. Uh, and similarly, consumers themselves are given um, certain rights to uh, seek private redress. So for instance, if a uh, travel company has misled a customer um, and there's been a breach of the consumer protection from unfair trading regulations, there are provisions in the UK which allow um, private consumers to bring claims themselves to seek a form of redress from the courts. So that's the position on enforcement as it is at the moment in the UK. In the EU, um, it's, it's a bit more of a mixed bag. And um, one of the reasons behind um, the, the reforms coming in the EU is that the Commission wants to see more consistency across all member states as to how the consumer law is enforced. 
um, they consider that the enforcement tools available for regulators in certain member states are quite weak. So for instance, as in the UK, there are no powers uh, for regulators in some member states to impose fines. Uh, so they want to see that changed. And um, unlike the UK, um, there are no, in, in, in many member states, there are no rights for consumers themselves to bring claims to seek private redress. So you know, what, what, what the uh, Commission wants to do, as with the UK, is to modernise these enforcement tools and to bring them um, up into line with the sort of sanctions that we see in uh, competition law cases and also uh, for breaches of the GDPR. Next slide, please. Um, the final thing I'm going to say by way of introduction before, before I hand over to Lucy to talk about the uh, changes to consumer law in the UK is just to flag that particularly in the UK, there is a real focus on the travel sector at the moment and the sorts of issues uh, that we're covering today. I mean, clearly the travel sector has been under the spotlight over the last two years in, in, in the UK with the CMA uh, establishing a team uh, um, within the CMA to tackle package holiday refunds um, and, and other what they saw as being misleading conduct um, by travel companies during the pandemic. Um, they, they have said that they are going to continue to monitor the sector and to continue to monitor compliance um, with undertakings where undertakings have been given to the CMA. Um, and interestingly enough, only last week, uh, the CMA um, re reminded uh, people by, by posting a couple of tweets about areas of focus for them over the next, over, over the next year, so this year. Um, the first of which is um, to, to look at unfair behaviour by businesses and to take what, what, what they say to be tough action to protect consumers where they see uh, companies misleading um, consumers. So they are really focusing on this in their annual plan for this year. And similarly with green claims, um, this is a real area of focus for the CMA as well. Um, they have said that there are particular industries that they want to look at, and they have started with the fashion industry, and there's a consultation and an, an investigation um, going on, which has just started concerning green claims in the fashion industry. But they have said as well that once they deal with the fashion industry, the next industry on their list is travel. So that's something that we expect to see develop over the course of the next year. Um, so that's it by way of introduction from me. J just to mention a couple of other things, which uh, I forget to mention, I forgot to mention at the outset. Th this recording is being, uh, sorry, th this presentation is being recorded and will be emailed to um, all participants uh, together with copies of the slides. Um, of, after we finish. There's also a question and answer um, button uh, we, 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 which you can use um, to, to post your questions. We'll try and pick up on those as we go along. Um, but if we don't, then we are planning to try and mop up any questions at the very end if, if we have time. Um, but we will try and guillotine at, uh, at, at 10 o'clock. Lucy. Thanks, Rhys. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope everybody is well. So, yes, I am going to talk through what is going on in the UK, and then I'll hand back to Rhys, who will focus on the EU side. So, last year, uh, the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy opened a consultation in July, which ran to October, um, about consumer and competition law reform. Um, the current status is that submissions have gone in, closed in October, and bees are currently analysing feedback. Um, why now? The, um, a lot of it is 
to do with the pandemic. Um, some of it is just regular review, but the pandemic and Brexit have, have had a big impact, I think. Um, we've all seen what the CMA have been trying to do over the last couple of years with refunds. Now they've been um, trying to have some, uh, they, they want some more teeth and now's the time to act. Um, but Brexit as well, the UK is still trying, but wants to keep up with the EU, uh, certainly doesn't want to fall behind. And while the EU is looking at um, consumer reform, the UK is as well. Um, it's also part of a wider initiative of UK government. There's a lot going on in government at the moment. Um, there's another consultation on the competition regime for digital markets. We have a new-ish digital markets unit, which is looking at all things digital uh, and consumer gets pulled into that. Um, and alongside that, there's, there's the review of the PTRs, um, which are coming up, um, although we're not sure how significant they will be, but there's obviously the Atoll consultation, more consultations on the aviation side as well so, so there's a lot going on so moving on to what the consultation covered I can I have the next slide please Jess thank you um, it covered three areas um, competition policy consumer rights and consumer law enforcement um, Bays and government see competition and consumer protection going hand in hand. Um, they say, and probably quite rightly, that consumer protection plays a crucial role in ensuring that competition and markets work for everyone. So they've looked at them together. Um, but we're not looking at competition today. You'll probably be pleased to know. Um, we're just going to focus on the consumer rights and the consumer law enforcement side. So starting with the consumer rights uh, side, what did the consultation say? What did it try and do? Well, it looked at um, three main areas, or two of which are more relevant to travel than, than the other. And uh, subscription contracts is probably the, the least relevant. But um, conversations I've had in the last week or so, you know, perhaps subscription for travel companies isn't uh, a million miles away. Um, so... Let's start with subscription contracts. Um, apparently, um, eight out of 10 of us have at least one subscription. I'd have probably said 10 out of 10 of us have had what, got at least one, but that's what uh, their research showed. Um, and subscriptions, they have a real benefit. They're a low cost and convenient way to buy things, and they're good for competition. Um, but some traders make it too difficult to cancel subscription contracts, automatic renewals, and not necessarily in the consumer's interest. So the consultation is looking at whether traders should be mandated to give better pre-contract information about the subscriptions, making sure that they nudge customers to cancel, but also making it easier to exit any subscription contracts that people enter into. So that's the first one, like I say, probably less relevant to travel at the moment. But the next two are more so. Um, fake customer reviews. Again, apparently 23 billion pounds of purchases a year are influenced by online reviews. Um, so it's a big number, and that's why they want to make sure um, fake reviews are stamped down um, there are existing laws on unfair commercial practices um, but they're considering specific laws or rules around fake reviews and there are two types of fake reviews there's a business paying somebody to write a fake review um, probably a, a positive review and then there are the real fake reviews i.e., somebody just writing a fake review having never been anywhere or done anything and the consultation is on both of those um, and there's one question around whether all um pay all cons paid for consumer reviews should be banned or whether it's just um uh, commissioned fake reviews but the question is they're concerned about smaller businesses because uh, reviews are a big way of, of, of money coming through the door and smaller businesses don't have a big marketing spend like the big companies so they're, um, they're exploring options on those fake reviews. And then thirdly, on the consumer rights pillar, um, they're looking at, uh, it, it sounds quite subjective, the exploitation of behavioural bias. This is how things are put on a website that you see when you go onto a website, emphasising certain things, understanding your behaviour when you shop online, because they now have more data about how you shop, uh, which again has, has good, uh, good sides to it, but the negatives are that it is manipulating options for consumers. Um, and they want to try and stop um, that manipulation um, as much as they can. So things like one click buy buttons, but also particular website designs that might not be in consumers interests. 
Um, and the suggestion in the consultation is that certain behaviour or behaviours or certain website designs even should also always be considered unfair and added to the list of unfair practices. Um, the, you know, the, the, it'll be interesting to see what uh, views were on that point. Um, but the, the, the idea of it always being unfair is that it gives businesses certainty that they can't do certain things rather than always being in a grey area. So the scope there, it's not, it's not huge and it is quite specific. Um, as I say, the, the outcome of the, the last two, the fake reviews and the exploitation of behavioural bias will, will be of interest. So moving on to the third and probably more um, interesting topic is uh, the third pillar, consumer law enforcement. Um, and as Rhys said at the start, uh, this has been on the radar for a long time. Um, there's been widespread criticism for a while uh, that the CMA's enforcement powers are weak, uh, ineffectual, they have no teeth, um, which is very different to the CMA's role on the competition side, which got changed a number of years ago. Um, so you, this is seen as bringing the CMA up to speed um, uh, alongside the competition side of things. Um, and so it looks like change is finally coming for, for the CMA. And the proposal um, for reform, there's a, there's a package of reforms of which the CMA's change of role is one. Um, and the headlines are, in terms of the powers that the CMA will have, um, the suggestion is that the CMA will be able to determine if consumer law has actually been breached. Um, believe it or not, they, they can't currently make that determination. As a matter of fact, you have to go to court. They have to go to court to make that determination. Um, they will be given powers to order a trader to take certain action to do or not do something um, or pay compensation to consumers or take other appropriate forms of redress. They will have um, uh, power to consider what is best. Um, again, at the moment, uh, CMA needs a court order to have um, and enforce a trader to take direct action. Um, it's way of uh, making changes through undertakings. Um, but the third point is that at the moment, the CMA can't enforce those undertakings. Again, it requires um, a journey to court to uh, get an enforcement order for those undertakings. It has no teeth in that sense. Um, so that, those three together will give the CMA uh, something that it certainly currently doesn't doesn't have and should speed up the idea is uh, speed up investigation speed up enforcement action to the benefit of consumers and then lastly um, the CMA will be able to order traders to pay fines again fines don't even exist at the moment on the civil side um, so that's a new introduction which I'll I'll come on to next um, but the CMA will be able to enforce and uh, make those fines rather than a, a, a trip to court. So as, as Reese said, um, CMA has been active in travel for a number of years anyway. Um, this is going to be a significant change, um, uh, which will be good for consumers, but for travel companies, um, something very much uh, to watch out for because of the other reforms that are coming in. If you can move to the next slide, please, Jess. As I said, the, there's a package of reforms that are on, under proposal. Um, it's the change in the CMA's role, but the, the biggest stick, I think, which isn't there at the moment, is fines, 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 fines. Um, there's currently no civil fines for the breaches themselves or failing to provide information to the CMA if and when they ask for it or any fines for, for frustrating enforcement procedures, making it difficult for the CMA to do what it wants to do. Um, but now there will be. And as we said at the top, the, the headline fine is GDPR equivalent, 10% of, of global turnover if a company is found to be in breach of consumer law. Um, and that is a, hu a huge number. Um, there's going to be um, the legislation or secondary legislation will set out how turnover is calculated. Uh, so we'll wait to see what would be caught within the net. But a 10 percent figure for breach is a, is a huge, huge number. But uh, alongside that and probably in addition to that, um, there could be fines for other non-compliance with the CMA investigation. So the CMA asks you for information and you don't provi provide it. The suggestion is that there's a, there could be a fine.
kind of 1% of turnover uh, with an additional daily 5% of turnover for every day that you that remain non-compliant. There's also a similar level of fine suggested for giving false or misleading information. Um, so those numbers together will add up. They're, they're the, the sticks that the CMA have been wanting for, for a long time and the numbers could, could be big. And then the last uh, area of reform is uh, the idea of providing better ADR, alternative dispute resolution for consumers and traders. Um, again, consumers are forced to go to court because ADR is currently not very well used or um, very well um, uh, um, ma maintained in this sector. Um, and in, in some areas, they're considering compulsory ADR, not for travel, but for uh, used car sales and home improvements, I think, were the two for compulsory. Um, but the idea is that consumers have better quality and better oversight um, of the ADR procedures. Uh, consumers know where to go, a bit like the ombudsman scheme that we see in financial services, um, that kind of thing. So businesses may well start seeing more formal complaints coming through their doors um, the costs of which which you know you have, probably have to start factoring in uh, into your budgets perhaps so that that's say the um, overall from the UK side you know just what next um, if you can move to the next slide please Jess um, after the consultation finished in October the CMA published or made public its um, response um, because the CMA isn't part of government it is separate and they're generally not surprisingly supportive of what has been said we don't know for definite yet which proposals will be put forward or come into force and we don't yet have a date from Bayes on when we will see a response but we expect it to be quite soon this year they're keen to get going on this and we think most if not all of the proposals that are being put forward will actually come into force um, so now is the time to start getting your house in order you know are there areas that you know or think you are not compliant with on the consumer law side whether it be the PTRs whether it be more general consumer law um, in your business now is the time to start doing compliance audits and looking at what you may need to change before the CMA do actually get the uh, the enforcement powers that are coming coming down the line so that's it from the UK. I shall hand back to Rhys to talk about what's going on in the EU. Thanks, Lucy. Um, so the EU is um, a bit ahead of the game in that they have already published a directive which requires member states to pass laws and bring those laws into force uh, by the 28th of May this year. So you know, these changes I'm going to talk about um, you know, have already been set in stone in the directive. So they should also by now have been implemented in all member states. Um, so we are effectively in a, in a transition period now where these laws will um, be brought into force by May of this year. Um, so what the EU has done is uh, effectively to publish a package of measures known as the New Deal for Consumers. Um, and some of these measures are legislative, which we'll focus on today, some of which are also sort of non-legislative as well. So the idea is um, to you know, provide a, a, a package of um, measures which will address what the Commission sees as being you know, the areas of consumer law which need to be addressed um, across the whole of Europe. Um, in terms of what that actually means in terms of, sort of new laws, um, a, 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 as with the situation in the UK, the EU is looking to you know, modernise sort of consumer law to address um, you know, certain features present in you know, online sales, uh, to address modern ways of you know, selling um, products and services. Um, and they're also, similarly to the UK, looking to give regulators you know, much greater enforcement powers so that they can make sure that companies comply with these with these laws. Um, Non-legislative uh, activities, the EU are looking at um, carrying out um, awareness campaigns so that consumers um, better uh, understand what their rights are. And they're also looking to 
help traders comply with their obligations. Um, again, through a, a scheme of um, information, telling traders what they need to do, and telling them how they need to comply. Uh, next slide, please, Jess. Um, so in terms of the EU laws which are being changed, um, and we have actually had a, a question around this, which, which, which I'll address at the same time. So um, the measures in the EU look to change for different directives. So um, some of these changes um, will only apply to some of the directives and some of the changes will apply to all of the directives. So um, when we come on and talk later about um, changing how these directives are enforced, um, those changes apply to all of, the, all of these directives. Um, whereas when it comes to talking about changes to um, the consumer law in terms of sales techniques, which are gonna be outlawed, you know, these are changes which have been made to the uh, to, to only two of the directors, so the Consumer Rights Directive and the uh, Unfair um, Commercial Practices Directive. Um, there was a question, or there is a question, uh, which someone has raised in uh, relation to the uh, his regulation 1107, which it, which is the regulation de dealing with the rights of disabled passengers and um, passengers with, with reduced mobility. Um, and is that going to be caught by these changes? Well, um, it's, it's not going to be, it, it, it's not one of the um, uh, regulations which is, which is going to be changed at a European level. Um, in terms of the UK, I think it probably is going to be, go, go, going to be affected because the laws uh, or the changes that Lucy uh, was talking about and particularly in terms of the new enforcement powers are meant to apply you know across all enforcement of consumer law and we will have to wait for the detail on that but my, my expectation is that probably at a UK level it, it will be caught um, but an EU level it's it's not one of the directives or it's a regulation caught by these uh, changes. Uh, next slides please. Um, so in terms of what's changing at a um, consumer law level, the first uh, aspect we'll look at is sales via online marketplaces. And um, the, the relevant directive defines an online marketplace quite broadly. Um, so, it, so it effectively defines an online marketplace as being any website which allows a consumer to contract with another trader or another consumer. So, you know, that's very broad indeed. And we'll, on, on the face of it, capture um, any uh, organization acting in some form of intermediary capacity. And what the commission is concerned about here is that consumers buying online will not always be um, conscious of who they're actually entering into a contract with and whether that third party is a professional trader or is a consumer. Um, now that's important because the, the, the various sort of consumer rights um, which the customer will have only kick in if that customer is dealing with a professional trader as opposed to buying from another consumer. So the commission wants to address this um, by putting an, an obligation on the marketplace to tell the customer whether the third party that they're contracting with is a professional trader or not, because then the customer will know whether they have the benefit of, of various of consumer rights. Next slide, please. Um, the next area that the commission is looking to address is around uh, online search facilities and particularly uh, addressing how search results are addressed. So the commission wants to see uh, online traders give customers information about the main parameters used to rank search results on a website and also the relative importance of those parameters. And what it um, seems to want is for customers to be provided that information 
um, in a way which is you know directly and easily accessible and also prominent on the search results page so that customers can understand um, why things have been ordered in a certain way um, and to the extent that you know some factors are more important than others then there has to be some form of explanation about you know how, how you know the relative importance of those different factors um, now linked in to that requirement is also a requirement to inform customers about whether results are I suppose, sort of natural search, search results or whether the search results have been paid for in some way. So they will, um, have, you know, that, that will have to be clearly labeled if a search result is um, being promoted and appears at the top of the results list um, because that particular um, company has paid to be at the top. Um, next slide, please. Um, now, similarly with the UK changes, the uh, Commission is looking at addressing um, the issue of customer reviews. And there are a number of measures um, in, in, in the um, directives which now seek to address this. Um, the first one is if a company is going to be presenting customer reviews uh, on their website, then, then they will have to say or disclose whether and how they've checked that that customer review has been provided by a customer that has either used or purchased um, the relevant travel service. So um, it's all about you know, clarity about, you know, who, about um, give it, giving the customer confidence that the customer review that they read is genuine effectively. Um, there's also going to be a, a prohibition on either submitting or commissioning someone else to submit fake reviews uh, on your behalf um, to avoid the situation where you know, a travel company is going on to TripAdvisor or whatever and you know, artificially boosting their, um, their, their, their um, reviews by, by, by posting a load of positive reviews. So that's going to be outlawed. And interestingly, um, there's also going to be a prohibition on travel companies um, referring customers to um, sort of social endorsements that they may have had. And one of the examples given in the directive is a situation where a travel company may have liked um, a, a post about that travel company um, and then referred the customer to all of these likes um, or, or, or something similar to that. Um, so all of those are going to be outlawed um, across the EU going forward. Um, next slide, please, Jess. And um, two, two other uh, changes to consumer law, which I'll just mention. The first one is against um, using ticket bots to bulk purchase event tickets. Um, now these are tickets for sporting events or for concerts where there may be a limitation on the number of tickets that you're allowed to buy. So if, for instance, you may be limited to buying you know, 10 tickets per person. Um, and you know, ticket bots have been used in the past to get around those restrictions and effectively bulk buy all of these events tickets uh, and then resell them to customers on their websites. So that's, that's going to be outlawed. Uh, under these changes. And the last thing to mention on consumer law, uh, I, I just want to flag, is around producing personalized pricing for customers using some form of automated, automated decision making. Um, now, it appears that this only, um, or, or rather, this doesn't apply to packages and transport sales. Um, but what the Commission wants to happen is that if a customer is seeing a price which has been personalized for them uh, using some form of automated decision making, then the customer must be told about that. Um, so on the face of it, it looks as though initially this will only apply to perhaps accommodation only sales. Um, but I would say that we're not going to cover this today, but um, the package travel directive is being, is being um, 
well, there is a there, there is a root and branch review being carried out on that this year. Um, so perhaps you know this is something which they will look at um, specifically in relation to packages um, as well. Uh, next slide, please, Jess. Um, so that's some changes to consumer law at a European level. In terms of changes to the enforcement of consumer law at a European level, um, very similar to the to the UK, the Commission um, has required all member states to make sure that their regulators are given the powers to impose fines of at least 4% of turnover um, uh, for breaches of um, consumer law. And um, there is going to be a sort of a common set of criteria to determine what the fine should be, looking at you know, various aggravating factors and mitigating factors. But it looks as though the most, um, th these, um, you know, the, the, the most significant fines will be reserved to those travel companies which carry out violations across a number of different member states. So what they um, refer to as widespread infringements. So again, you know, the purpose of this change is you know, to make enforcement of this consumer law um, um, serious, to give the regulators you know, the tools that they need to get companies to become compliant with all of this um, consumer law uh, and really to bring it um, up to the same levels as, as you know, GDPR and competition law fines. Um, the next thing that the Commission is doing in terms of enforcement is um, giving consumers personal rights, which they may or may not not have already, depending on um, what, what, what the position is in a particular member state. So in the UK, consumers already have private rights to seek compensation, for instance, if there has been a breach of the um, unfair commercial practices regulations. And um, the Commission is now going to roll out a similar concept across the whole of the EU. So consumers will have individual remedies, you know, including compensation, um, possibly a price reduction, or uh, a right to terminate a contract um, where there has been some sort of um, misleading or unfair commercial practice um, by the travel company um, to them. Um, and the final change happening at a European level I want to mention is uh, this concept of collective redress. And um, this is um, so similar to aspects of the law as it already stands in the UK at the moment. But the Commission wants to allow private uh, organisations such as consumer organisations, maybe, maybe uh, somebody like which, they want to give them the right to bring um, representative actions on behalf of all consumers. And actually what's driven this is really the Dieselgate scandal and the commission um, wanting to allow a consumer organization to bring one claim against the likes of Volkswagen, uh, which would lead to you know, all consumers caught um, by, by Dieselgate to be refunded. So they're looking at introducing uh, these sorts of representative actions as we have in the UK. Um, next slide, please, Jess. Um, questions. So there have been some um, questions. I, I, I might take the um, first one before perhaps asking uh, Lucy to um, address the one on fake customer re reviews, mm -hmm. if that's okay, Lucy. Um, so we've got a question which asks, um, and I think this is in relation to the UK uh, enforcement powers to be given to the CMA and uh, potentially the CAA. The question is whether there'll be a, a, a right of appeal from the decision of the regulator to impose a fine. Um, well, that's something which um, is being looked at. So the consultation asked for views to be expressed as to whether um, companies ought to have a right to uh, appeal uh, a decision by a regulator to impose a fine uh, and if so what that appeal would look like 
So it could be that um, um, the travel company would have a full right of appeal. So that would effectively be a complete rehearing on the issue in court. Um, the alternative is um, any appeals may be limited to errors of law by the CMAs or the CAA. So if they've you know, misread the relevant regulations, then there may be a limited appeal uh, on legal issues alone and not on factual issues. So those are things which are which are being looked at. Um, but what I, what I would say, either, either way, having um, you know, dealt with a number of these CMA investigations over the last um, couple of years, um, it's going to completely change the dynamic when you're dealing with an investigation if the CMA can unilaterally impose a fine, because then the onus would be on the travel company to challenge that by going to court, rather than as we have at the moment, you know, the CMA having to go to court to get to, to, to get any form of relief. So I think it's really going to change the dynamic on, on how travel companies deal with regulators. Lucy, do you want to address the fake Reviews yeah, question. of course. Yeah. So the question uh, is, will the focus on fake customer reviews in the UK consultation cover the use of influencers posting content on social media, or is it just looking at written reviews of product services, experiences, etc.? And I think it will be both. It doesn't explicitly say as much, um, but I mean, influencers are um, one of the biggest biggest reviewers um, and I came across a business recently whose entire business is based on influencers um, posting their travel experiences so it will be well the, the, the question is um, not I think it will, it will cover all forms of medium it would be videos Instagram posts which have got some some review on it and you know, at, the, at the moment now if you see sort of hashtag ad uh, on a post you know that's the sort of advertising standards trying to cover this this um, area of concern um, the question is whether um, any paid for all influencers are paid whether any paid for uh, reviews should be out banished prohibited or whether it's just fake paid for reviews but regardless of where those reviews are posted they, they would be caught and like I say influencers are going to be a big part of that it's a good question thank you um, we've got another one on GDPR fines. Shall I take that one, Rhys? Um, so the question, fines could potentially be eye-watering, but fines under the GDPR to date have not been, have they? In travel, BA and Marriott both had provisional fines for data breaches slashed to relatively low amounts. Um, and there is a lot of truth in that. Yeah, the, I mean, the, the headline initial fines that were banded around for the BA breach, um, the Marriott breaches, and there's been quite a few over in Ireland as well, are, are eye-watering and they have been watered down to a more manageable level um, once the, uh, the sort of the mitigation factors um, and the, it's been properly assessed. So I think, I mean, the 10% is the, um, the, the red warning light. It could be that. Um, and if that, you know, the, 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 I suspect in the first few years of enforcement, the CMA are going to be looking to make um, make their mark and make a uh, um, uh, make um, uh, um, what's the word? Sorry, make an example of of particular in the, the people in the industry to make sure that they're not caught out. So. Um, I think we'll see some big headlines, but whether it's 10%, um, you know, we'll, we'll see. Um, there's another question, and I'm, I'm not sure if I've understood this correctly, but somebody said that they've um, read something about the new directive, and if you are advertising a price reduction, the I think I think the I think the question is that the reference price, so that's the kind of original price before applying the price reduction um, has to be the lowest price during the last 30 days. Um, is that applicable to package travel? Um, I mean, that, that whole concept is um, applic uh, the, the reference pricing and discounting and how you present it applies to package travel as it applies to any other industry. So you know, there are certain rules around um, what 
what the reference price must be and you know how long must you have had the reference price um, before you can genuinely claim that something is a discount um, so so that that does apply to package travel as it does to anything else um, and I think that sort of links into another question which I'll just pick up in relation to this profile pricing and why are transport tickets excluded from profile pricing? Well, well, the, the short answer is that the new rules on profile pricing appear in the uh, Consumer Rights Directive and the Consumer Rights Directive doesn't apply to passenger transport. So you know, they, they've put it in there. Um, wh why doesn't it apply? Uh, and, and similarly, that, that directive doesn't apply to package travel which is why I said that this concept of profile pricing doesn't apply to packages and transport only tickets. However, um, there are, as I said, there are there, there is a consultation going on, going on at a European level looking at the package travel directive. So it may be something which is being looked at separately in relation to package travel. I don't know why um, or whether, whether um, there is also going to be a similar uh, consultation looking at um, you know regulation 261 and whether similar concepts ought to be brought into that I guess is possible um, what else have we got um, we've got I mean perhaps uh, there's something here on influencers Lucy which 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 you might want to cover uh, I'll, I'll just but there's one question directed to something I said which is whether the new rules regarding search rankings um, really change um, the, the position as it is today um, so um, I think I, I mean I think the position on this is that at the moment we have uh, very general rules in uh, the unfair commercial practice directive and in the uh, unfair contract uh, the uh, unfair practice regulations in the UK and what these new rules do are to be a bit more specific about what must be done and they are a bit more prescriptive at a European level um, to my mind uh, about exactly uh, the, the precise explanation which must be given on the search results page um, because they 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 require the travel company not just to explain the various parameters that the companies use to determine those search results but also the relative weight of each um, so perhaps that's you know a bit more specific than what we have at the moment which is just sort of general obligations not to mislead customers and to give customers information which you know is, is considered to be relevant to them when when they're buying on a website um but and and i suppose the other thing is um there is probably you know inconsistency across the uh various member states as to how the unfair uh, commercial practice directive is implemented so in the uk you know yes there's been enforcement action here already around search results and you know various booking platforms had to give um, undertakings to the CMA on this. Um, perhaps the position is not say, the same across uh, every other member state. So part of the reason for doing this uh, for the Commission is to make sure that everyone's applying the same rules. Um, just picking up on the influencers, um, somebody very kindly sent a, a BBC article that's on today about influencers not disclosing that they are adverts on their social media posts. And that's the kind of thing that I think is uh, looking to be, say, stamped out. That should have been, you know, the, the Advertising Standards Agency is already on that. Um, but in the, you know, in the, the, the um, review world, um, that is exactly what it's trying to stamp out. So thank you for sharing that. Um, there's a question on the online marketplace point that you made, Reese, and I think there's perhaps you can look at that, but there's an additional bit about online marketplaces, which is um, uh, linked. It's not the, the current, the, the what's going on in the consumer laws at the moment. It's actually a different um, 
piece of legislation which is being changed this year, which is a, a competition uh, piece of legislation, a, a block exemption, um, which is going to change how businesses contract with online marketplaces. There are going to be um, uh, slightly there are going to be changes around yeah, what has to be disclosed um, to end consumers. Um, and there's a bit more uh, B2B protection built in. A lot of this is B2C, but the 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 competition side is there's a bit more B2B protection. So that's you know topic for another day, but um, linked to the question on online marketplaces. Can I can I address the question? So there's a question here, it's a great question. How do you think the CMA will approach a travel company breaching consumer law refunds because their suppliers are refusing to refund them already paid out monies? Well, um, I mean, I've got quite a bit of experience dealing with the CMA on, on this particular issue of the last couple of years. And I can tell you that they are completely unsympathetic to travel companies uh, which are unable to pay refunds to customers because they're waiting to get the money back from the suppliers. Um, the, the, C, the CMA's rather glib approach is to say, uh, you have an obligation to pay customers back within 14 days and either you comply with that uh, and you organize your business so that you can, uh, or you don't. And if you don't, then you'll face enforcement action from us. Um, I think that's, that's their um, position on that is, is pretty clear. And, and um, I mean, what they did have sympathy for was that, um, you know, COVID was obviously an, 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 an exceptional event. And um, they were sympathetic in given, giving travel companies uh, a longer period of time to get themselves uh, back into being compliant. Um, but I don't, but, but I think, you know, were we to have another wave at some point in the future, I think I, I would expect that the CMA would be less sympathetic um, to, to travel companies and their expectation would be that, um, you know, they have to anticipate these things now and organise themselves accordingly. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's a horrible position to be in, um, but, but that's certainly how the CMA see it. Uh, should we should we should we address one more question? Yeah. Block off. Um, sorry, I'm just scouting um, through which ones. Well, I, uh, well, whilst you have a look I, at, at that, Lucy, should I just? So that same person has, I think, posted an additional question. Do you think uh, the CMA will take action down the chain, or just focused on the easier targets of the travel organizer? Um, I think they will always go for the easy targets, um, as as we've as we've seen, um, uh, particularly with the aborted action that they took against Ryanair and British Airways. Um, however, um, one thing to mention is that you know the, the, we 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 are led to believe that there's going to be uh, a DFT consultation. You know, any time now on um, uh, on consumer rights in the aviation sector. So um, there's also, as part of the review of the package travel directive at a European level, um, obviously lots of travel companies are making the point that there is a disconnect between uh, the obligations of organizers to refund customers and then um, the obligations of airlines to refund customers in uh, sort of force, force majeure situations. So I think it's possible. Um, I mean, it's, it, it's certainly going to be canvassed by travel companies that um, something should be done uh, to ensure that you know, money flows back down the chain so that travel companies can pay monies you know, back to consumers and comply with their 14 day refund obligations. But I mean, how that's going to play out and what regulations we'll end up with, if any, on that, I don't, I don't know. I'll just take one more one, uh, one more, which is, are there any restrictions on the advertised from price in the UK? I mean, one of the um, part of the UK consultation is about 
you know, clarity up front, having all fees, charges up front on page one. And there is there's consumer law, which currently says that should be the case, but it's not specific enough. Um, so I think there is there's going to be tighter rules on um, uh, advertising prices and whether where that price is seen, how it's seen, how it's um, shown to you on the website, um, uh, which will link to existing laws on advertised prices. So I think that sort of triangle will will be joined up once we know the outcome of the the, the UK consultation. Okay, right. it's 10 o'clock, so I think we'll wrap it up there. Thanks to everybody for attending and uh, thank you to everyone for uh, submitting questions. As I said at the outset, we will be circulating a uh, recording to everybody together with a copy of the slides. And if there is anything else that anybody wants to ask, then feel free to follow up by email. Thanks very much. Thanks all, have a good day. <laughs>